questions the human mind cannot answer. Out of reach, past all we can see, hear and touch, beyond all we understand, lies... The Extraordinary. Delta Sierra Gillia, there is no known aircraft in your vicinity. It was a clear Saturday night when Flight Services Officer Steve Roby became the last person to have any contact with a young pilot by the name of Frederick Valentich. speeds two, three times, I could not identify. I personally don't think that uh, he fabricated the, his disappearance. Like many, Valentich's family, particularly his father Guido, believe he was taken by something from another world. I still stay, uh, believe that he was involved with uh, an extraterrestrial UFO expert Paul Norman investigated Frederick Valentich's disappearance. His verdict? Definitely a close encounter of the first kind. As far as I'm concerned, it was a genuine uh, UFO. It's just on 14 years since Frederick Valentich's desperate radio call from over Bass Strait. To this day, no trace has been found of him or his plane. Why not? Can someone simply disappear off the face of the earth? It was three days before that fateful night that Valentich started down the road that would end in his destruction. On October 18, 1978, a young civil pilot went to Melbourne's Moorabbin Airport trying to hire a plane. G'day. G'day. I'd like to hire a plane to fly to King Island. The weather's closing in at best rate. It's too dangerous to fly there today. I've flown in bad weather many times before. Three days later, he was back. The weather was fine, and Frederick Valentich got the OK to fly to King Island. When VHDSJ was cleared for takeoff, all was normal, except for one thing. Valentich had not alerted anyone on King Island that he was coming. No one called, so there was no one there to turn on the landing lights. If anyone should have known a light plane was on its way to King Island, it was Brian Jones. As flight service supervisor, it was his job to light the runway for incoming night traffic. I remember the day quite well. It was uh, a Caulfield Cup day, and I've been playing golf. Brian, phone call. When I got a phone call to say that an aircraft was missing across Bass Strait, which was Delta Sierra Juliet, the Cessna 172. It should have been a routine 69-minute flight from Moorabbin, along the coast to Cape Otway, out over Bass Strait and on to King Island. But as the drama was unfolding in the night sky, other strange events were about to unfold on the ground. Oh, on that night, I decided I'd go up in the, uh, the area outside the uh, hut and take the, uh, the sun setting in the, in the beautiful end of the west. Oh, I took a series of photographs about six in, in all, at around about 15, 20 second intervals. And, uh, and that was it. Roy Manifold never saw or heard the mysterious object he caught on film. He could not explain the image he'd captured, and nor could Kodak. They come back and they said, oh, there's definitely not a, a developing error. It's nothing to do with the, uh, the film or the development of the film on the print, but they couldn't explain what it was and why it was there. Paul Norman had no doubts what was on the film. He sent the photos to the laboratories of Ground Saucer Watch in America. What they discovered was a solid, metallic object about seven metres in diameter, about two kilometres out to sea. It was an unknown object uh, rising from the uh, water and it had a lot of mist around it. Uh, indicating it did come from the water. After takeoff, all was normal for a while. Valentich made routine contact with air traffic control at Tullamarine. It was 19 minutes past six. The weather was good, visibility excellent, with scattered clouds and light winds. Then came the concerned call. It was to be the last conversation Frederick Valentich ever had. Melbourne Delta Sierra Juliet is not an aircraft, it is... Delta Sierra Juliet, Melbourne, can you describe the aircraft? Delta Sierra Juliet 
as it's flying past, it's a long shape. Few people have ever heard these words. The exact words uttered by Frederick Valentich in his last call to air traffic control. Melbourne, it's approaching now from due east towards me. Delta Sierra Juliet, Melbourne. Delta Sierra Juliet seems to be playing some sort of game. It's flying over me at speeds two, three times I could not identify. Delta Sierra Juliet, Roger, and how large would the uh, object be? Delta Sierra Juliet, Melbourne. It seems like it's stationary. What I'm doing right now is orbiting, and the thing is just orbiting on top of me. On King Island, life was going on as normal. But some did report strange lights in the sky, as did scores of others on the Victorian mainland. There were more uh, daytime sightings reported on that same day than any period of activity I've ever investigated. In my mind, knowing my son, I was sure that he was encountered something very seriously because he would never go on that radio and compromise his future career as a um, pilot. It is hovering and it is not an aircraft. Delta Sierra Juliet. Delta Sierra Juliet, Melbourne. Delta Sierra Juliet, Melbourne. Delta Sierra Juliet. Delta Sierra Juliet, Melbourne. 7, 12 and 28 seconds, those were Frederick Valentich's last words, then a long and loud metallic sound. The engine had the characteristics, for example, electromagnetic effect. Frederick Valentich was never heard from again. At this moment, he simply vanished. When Brian Jones was finally alerted, it was already too late. A distress phase had been raised on the aircraft and they wanted uh, me to get out to the airport here, uh, turn on the runway lights and start calling the aeroplane. Delta Sierra Julia, this is King Island. If you're reading me and cannot transmit, I'll give you the service conditions. The wind is calm. QNH1028, sky clear. Runway lights are on and no traffic for your descent. We took off and we flew due north to Cape Wickham Lighthouse, which is the northern tip of the island. It was an unreal night. It was uh, uh, kind of strange for this t uh, part of the world. There was no wind. And when we got out to sea, just north of Wickham Lighthouse, you could actually see the reflection of the stars in the water. Jones's plane was the first to search in the area. Over the next four days, it was joined by civilian and military aircraft, including an RAAF Orion, which has special sensors for tracking metal in water. But not a trace of Valentich or his plane were found. The fact so far, Valentich was flying a single-engine Cessna alone on a clear, still night. There was no other aircraft known to be in the area. Numerous people reported seeing strange lights in the sky all around the Victorian coast. Roy Manifold captures something on film that to this day has not been explained. And Frederick Valentich reports being buzzed by a mysterious flying craft. For Guido Valentich and his family, the mystery has been a 14-year nightmare, made worse by the fact they still don't know the fate of their son. Good morning, sir. I'm after Mr. Valentich. That's me. Mr. Valentich, can you tell us where your son is, thanks? No, he's supposed to come back from King Island last night. The worst things that might happen to him uh, would have been being abducted by uh, some unknowing civilization and uh, that possibly will take, we don't know how many years, before we'll be able to see him again. In my heart, I do believe that one day I will see him again. I, I, I don't feel that he, he staged his disappearance. Uh, I'm quite open on it. I'm, uh, uh, I, 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 really, uh, I really don't know. Possibly went on a, could be a suicide mission. And it was a real encounter with an unknown flying object. Valentich's girlfriend, Rhonda Rushton, had flown with him on every flight except his last. In a strange postscript to this story, Rhonda travelled to this motel 
for a rendezvous planned before his disappearance. The motel manager claims Ronda asked for Valentich, and when told he wasn't there, seemed visibly upset. This was seven days after his last fateful radio call. Didn't he the young lad that went missing over Had she there? finally come to grips with the fact that his disappearance was not a hoax? To this day, this event remains unexplained, as does the disappearance of Frederick Valentich. The history of mankind. There have been those whose qualities stood out from the rest. Julius Caesar's power, Albert Einstein's genius, Helen Keller's courage. The man in this story from Alison Holloway may take his place among the unique for very strange reasons. For the better part of this century, God was an ill-defined word in the Soviet Union. Officially, Communist Russia was atheist, and such things as worship and belief in miracles could only exist behind closed doors. But since the Iron Curtain parted, we've seen how Soviet citizens cope with the need to believe in some form of a higher being. While belief in God may have been discouraged by the Kremlin, other forms of belief in the supernatural took on a more grounded form. Scientific experiments in parapsychology, telepathy and such phenomena as Karelian photography were far more widespread than in the West. And the belief in the power of mind over matter has become almost a religion in itself. Valery Lavrinienko, a man with apparent superhuman power over his own body. His nearest equivalent in Western civilization was perhaps the great Harry Houdini. But Houdini's astounding performances and magical escapes from impossible situations may pale next to the physical phenomena and powers over body that we're about to see performed by this man, Lavrinienko. To his followers, he's a 42-year-old living Superman on Earth. A man who can pull a 65-ton locomotive, able to immerse himself in a vat of boiling water, burn paper with his bare hands, and much, much more. As we enter his superhuman world on a bitterly cold day in the Ukraine, a crowd is gathered. Lavrinienko is about to demonstrate for the camera a medical and scientific impossibility. The claim that he can hold his breath underwater for 15 minutes and live. Lavrinienko's only reservation on this freezing winter's day is the cold and that howling wind. His only artificial device is a clasp designed to keep his nose shut tight. The average experienced diver can hold his breath a maximum of three minutes. The only man ever recorded to surpass this was the French oceanographer Jacques Mejeur, who remained submerged for five minutes. Lavrinienko has just hit two minutes, 30 seconds. Our clock will continue counting while we examine some other demonstrations of this Russian Superman. Some months ago, there was this scene at the central railway station in the city of Donetsk. Again, a crowd formed to witness Lavrinienko attempt to substantiate one of his more spectacular claims to superhuman strength and endurance. We will spare you the vivid footage of Lavrinienko threading wire through the flesh of both his forearms. The other ends are attached to the last car of a 65-ton locomotive in the railway yard. As snow falls, Lavrinienko assumes his position.
At the scene of Lavrinienko's underwater experiment, the clock has reached four minutes, 30 seconds. At this point, Lavrinienko's carbon dioxide level should be critically high. His oxygen almost gone, anoxic brain damage can occur once oxygen hits zero. To illustrate the difference between his own extraordinary physical powers and the feats of commercial stuntmen, Lavrinenko is quick to perform their standard fare of, say, lying on broken glass while a truck drives over his chest. Or having bricks smashed on his head before reeling off a board full of numbers, randomly chosen by the audience only moments before. But this demonstration of burning objects is more impressive. Lavrinienko has proved to medical experts he can stop his heart beating long enough to be declared legally dead. And here he is burning the top off a newspaper by focusing the electrical currents of his body through the tip of his finger. By now, Lavrinienko's body shows greater signs of stress. His muscles are contracted and agitated movement from his legs is causing the water to form waves more and more bubbles rise to the surface. On this day, Lavrinienko will not remain submerged the promised 15 minutes. He is pulled from the tub after 9 minutes, 13 seconds. It is, though, 4 minutes, 13 seconds longer than any other human has ever achieved. But just when you thought it was time he got out of the water, there is this. A fire burning below a vat of foaming, boiling water. The temperature has been measured. What Lavrinienko does next needs no explanation. story of Australian radio star Doug Mulray and the night the line between the real and the supernatural blurred. She sort of turned as she moved across the room but just for one or two seconds was there before my eyes and then gone. Since she was in her 20s Lucy Ryle has experienced Christ-like bleeding of her palms, her feet, and from the apparent wounds that might be inflicted by a crown of thorns. Many times I asked the Lord why me. Many, many times. And um, again, I still don't know that answer. Also, the final dramatic moment in the life of American hellfire and brimstone comedian, Sam Kinison. <laughs> I'd never met Doug Mulray before. Like most of you, I knew him as a wild and crazy radio voice and the host of that controversial naughtiest home video TV show. You may be familiar with the Doug I'm talking about. Warning. This is an adults-only program. Not, I repeat, not Australia's funniest home video show. Certain scenes and language may offend some woozy girl's blouse and nancy boy viewers. But the Doug Mulray we're about to meet is an entirely different one. The story he's going to tell is dramatically different. And at first, he didn't want to tell it. I'm loath to do it because clearly when one discusses the supernatural, the paranormal, one attracts criticism, cynicism, loses friends. But it is a compelling story and it's something which actually happened to me and in part to a good many other people who 
still have their wits about them. With our reassurance that we'd take his story seriously, Doug agreed to share with us his personal account of the dramatic events of a Black Friday in 1976. That night, Doug Mulray was a young radio announcer with Radio 2GO on the New South Wales Central Coast. Throughout this story, you will hear actual recordings from that night. When Black Friday comes, well, it's arrived, and in a big way. We're broadcasting live from the Inn of the Damned at 2GO on a Friday night. Black Friday. I'm Mark Smith here. 13 minutes after 7, here's Doug Mulray. The event started to change shape when Romy Warren, the medium we'd invited to participate, started to do some shtick. I think we all became concerned, if not alarmed. I remember Bob Byrne was certainly alarmed when Romy Warren did a thing that she described as transfiguration, if my memory serves me well, where she stood against a door in this candlelit room while we were playing one of our tunes and made, believe it or not, her entire face disappear, become a, a, a disc of light. There was a, a hairline and there was a shoulder line, but there was no, no face there to speak of at all. And, and as soon as you realised that she somehow remarkably caused her face to evaporate from the space that you had recognised as her face moments before, uh, a, a suit was superimposed a Chinaman. I, I, I can remember this as if it were yesterday. And I'm sure the other guys would corroborate this. And, and I want you, Bob, to come over here and tell us what you saw. I saw a Chinaman's face, and I said to, to uh, Doug, without any prompting, I said, a Chinaman, uh, I, I can see a Chinese. But I must admit that I was kind of spooked by the whole thing. There was the face of an ancient Chinaman where her face had been a second before. The Chinese face disappeared. It was replaced by a stream of faces that came and went so quickly that the impression one got was that her face was in some way plastic. It leapt around. At one stage, I remember this distinctly too, there was the face of a huge Indian, American Indian, that eclipsed even her hairline and she appeared to, to grow. A whole body appeared to take on the size of this remarkable Indian man, whoever, whatever he or it was. I was at this point <laughs> fairly convinced that we were into something considerably larger than we'd originally envisaged. We, we had tea, we had coffee, I mean we took a little bit of settling after that experience and then moved into that section of the program we designed, which was the walk outside and upstairs to the upper room where according to the information we had from Terry Burke and those people who looked for us into Gosford Court records a woman had been murdered and subsequently appeared to her a long uh, vanished husband the supposed murderer uh, to appear to him on his second visit to the house and, and, and frighten him to death that was the legend that surrounded the house when we designed the broadcast I thought it would be a cute trick. After having had the experiences downstairs with Romy Warren, the aforementioned experiences, I began to wonder about what we would see. We'll find out what happened in just a minute. <laughs> TV personality Doug Mulray with more on the night the line between reality and the supernatural blurred. We went up the stairs with a long lead, the two of us. Uh, as I say, an outside staircase. Uh, the upper room was accessed from an outside staircase. And we got to the top of the stairs and opened the door and you could see across the water the moonlight through the broken glass pane. And we stood and we waited. I remember noticing an appreciable drop in the ambient temperature of the room. I'd read enough about ghosts and, and 
sightings of ghosts to know that this was one of the things people spoke about. I commented on it. I said that maybe we did have some kind of presence here. Romy said definitely. She told me that it was a woman, as I remember, and that if we were just silent for a while, we may be able to see her. I can feel a presence. What sort of a presence do you feel? Perhaps the talking interrupts it. Just talking interrupts it at all. Yes, can we have just a second's quiet? Just a moment. The automatic gain control, that device at radio stations which picks up whatever noise there is to keep it balanced, to keep something on the radio, sucked up the sound of the insects outside. And I can remember to this day the, the intense sound of the, the chirruping, the, the grasshoppers, the cicadas, whatever they were in the bush. Loud, hammering, a cold in the room. But nothing, nothing did we see. So after what seemed like an eternity, it was probably 10 or or 12 seconds, I, I said, well, it looks like uh, we're going to be disappointed this evening. It doesn't seem that we'll be witnessing any ectoplasm and maybe it's time to go back to the, uh, the central commentary position, with apologies to Richie Benner. We crossed to, I think it was Mark Smith who was on the air, who did what radio announcers do, time call, weather check, record introduction, commercial break, and the moment, the moment, that our mic was switched off the moment we crossed back to the studio downstairs. Before my eyes, certainly, before Romy's eyes, she corroborated everything I saw. A figure of a woman, opaque, uniform in colour, regardless of whether we were looking at skin or clothing, appeared in the furthest left-hand corner of the room, and moved towards us and across in front of us to the other end of the room. She had on a bonnet, she had on a full skirt, which had a tight bodice and a, I guess what you would call a bustle over the derriere. I don't remember her moving her feet I don't remember her walking per se, I just remember the image, like a, almost like a photographic image of a person who was fluid. I mean, definitely, it was not a static image. She, she sort of turned as she moved across the room, but just for one or two seconds was there before my eyes and then gone. As we shut down and cross back to you, well, I don't know, but uh, Romy, perhaps you could uh, describe what happened for us. Well, I think I said to you, did you see that? And you said, yes, a woman. Was Doug Mulray the only person apart from the medium to see the vision? He may have thought so. Later in the night, when uh, driving back to Gosford, Doug and Romy Warren went into the upstairs room with a microphone and just missed seeing this image. They came back on after a song and described what they've seen, and I thought, whoa, that's exactly what I saw. That's really strange. And she was as mysterious as she was real. And I can see her now as I tell you about the experience and have no doubt whatsoever that what I saw was what's popularly referred to as a ghost. I, I still have no idea what it means. There are theories that have been offered, theories I can offer you, but the reality, the single reality that dominates my memory of the experience is this spectre. And it was there and was real and it confounds everything I believe. church in New Mexico, before a congregation that has come to believe absolutely in a miracle, Rafael Abramovitz watched a woman named Lucy Rael raise her hands and saw blood actually drip from her palms. She opens her hands. There's a red spot in each palm. Blood appears and then begins to flow. 
And when that happens, the faithful rush towards her, looking for salvation, healing, and hope. The wounds appear mysteriously and vanish without a trace. And although there are doubters, doubt is no barrier to believers. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, touch your heart. It happened again this night. The faithful had gathered in the small church and they had brought with them only their disabilities, their fears, and their imperfections. They had come to look for something to hold on to, something to believe in, a sign. And again, Lucy Rael delivered. In Jesus' name. Tonight, when the blood sign came on my hands, I didn't know it was there. I had no feeling. I was uh, just ministering to, to the people. And someone out in the audience just pointed at my hands, and I realized they were talking, perhaps, of the uh, blood. And I looked at my hands, and it was there. Stigmata, the bleeding of the hands and feet in the way Jesus Christ bled from his wounds during the crucifixion, has for centuries been a lifeline for Christians needing a more tangible proof of Christ than mere faith. The most famous stigmatic of recent times was Padre Pio, an Italian priest in the town of San Giovanni Rotunda. For much of his life, he locked himself away from the thousands who flocked to his small church, hoping to witness a miracle. In 1922, the church ordered him to stop saying mass in public. This lasted for 10 years. On the occasions he revealed himself, he bled profusely from both his hands and his feet. A measure of the power of his stigmata was best demonstrated on the day of his death in 1968. More than 100,000 people gathered in the small village and tears flowed for a week. For his followers, a living miracle had died. While the Catholic Church has always been a cautious skeptic in matters of miracles, the process of canonization to sainthood for Father Pio has begun. Jesus touched you. Yes. Thank him. Give him the glory. Lucy Rael's ministry is a long way from the Vatican, but the people who have followed her stigmatic phenomenon the past 22 years are as fanatical about her as the 100,000 in San Giovanni Rotondo. The first time that it happened was in 1973 in Taos. It was... Uh, I looked at myself, my hands are bleeding, there's wounds in my hands. I didn't know where it was coming from and it scared me. It was uh, a feeling of what's happening. And uh, shortly after that, it was like a peace that came over me. According to the available religious literature, there have been more than 300 reported cases of stigmata in the world since the 11th century. And in each case, the nature of this manifestation of the crucifixion has brought as much controversy as wonder. For every believer, this seems to be a doubter. Rael confronts them everywhere she travels across the south of the United States. All good things come from God. Good things come from God. Small churches invite her to preach and heal, and if it is God's wish, she bleeds. I didn't realize the blood was coming already. Oh, my goodness. I would not stand before a large crowd of people and allow these people to just stand there and look at me and uh, say who knows what. Um, it's, it's very hard. It, it, has, it has not been an easy life and an easy thing to have. And I know that if, if this was not real, I wouldn't do it. Rael's daughter, Angelica, travels with her mother from church to church as supporter and helper. Though there was a brief moment when God seemed to have bestowed two miracles on the same family. The signs appeared on her body on one time, and this was when she was like six months old. And it happened, her little hands, her hands open, and her little feet, and uh, I believe she also got the stripes on her back. The welts on Lucy Rael's back are consistent with other recorded cases of stigmata. 
They emerge involuntarily like the wounds in the hands and feet. And in about 35 to 45 minutes, they are gone. Nowhere on the body does the manifestation leave scars. Though the wounds and bleeding can appear almost any time during worship, Rael says they always appear without fail on Easter and Good Friday. Many times I ask the Lord why me. Many, many times. And uh, again, I still don't know that answer. Precious Heavenly Father, we just want to thank The requests for Rael to take medical tests are a constant in her life. She usually complies, though after 22 years, sees the exercise only as an instrument to turn doubters into believers and therefore bring them closer to her God. Rael says she has no power to save or heal, that the Lord works miracles using her as his vehicle. Her hands, she says, are like any other hands most of the time. So, what accounts for stigmata if everything that seems to happen to Lucy Rael does indeed happen. Psychiatrist Dr. Alfred Kudley. Think about uh, an individual who blushes or blanches. You see how clearly under psychological circumstances the total vascular system in the body is responsive to emotional state of mind. And the same thing can happen therefore uh, insofar as the bleeding from the hand, for example. Sing it to Jesus. But for the followers who worship and at times seem to enter communal rapture in the presence of Rael stigmata, mortal medicine is irrelevant to their belief. They come looking for a miracle, and when they're lucky enough to have arrived on a night like this one, they leave convinced that they have witnessed the manifestation of Christ on earth. I really don't know about that. I'd like to tell you a story about a guy named Sam Kinnison, a one-time minister who became America's most drugged out, raucous stand-up comic. I was up on my knees in rice paddies with Johnson Edward going up against Charlie, slugging it out with him while pussies like you were back here partying, putting headbands on, doing drugs, listening to the goddamn Beatle albums. Oh, no! Just before the end of his life, Sam cleaned up his act and got married, only to die the night after his honeymoon at the hands of two drunken kids who ploughed into his car head on. But the final moment of Sam's life was peaceful. According to the road manager who cradles Sam's head in his hands, the screaming preacher seemed to make peace with some higher being in the very second he passed from this earth. Mahid Khoury recalls the remarkable final moment of Sam Kinison's life. And he stood up for a few seconds, a second, second and a half, and then his knees buckled and we just put him down on the ground. And he kept asking, how come now? I just don't understand it. Why? Why me? Why now? How come? He, uh, kept saying it over and over. And Carl, his, his, his other friend, was holding his head downwards, and I was, I was on my knees holding him by the hand, caught on the mirror and holding this, his uh, right hand. But he was squeezing it very tightly and uh, kept saying, uh, I don't want to go. Why? How come? Why now? From this moment, Sam Kinnison seemed to be in touch with someone, tuned into the hereafter. And I looked at Sam and he said, how come? And then he started saying, okay, 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 okay. That was it. He let loose of my arms. And it went very, it went down so nice and mellow like it was, there was no pain in his death. But he was talking to somebody and it wasn't any of us. One of the world's best known movies was High Noon, starring Gary Cooper. Years later, as crowds of media gathered around Cooper's Hollywood house, 
his dogs howled at the sky at exactly high noon. And at the stroke of high noon, Gary Cooper died. An untold story. Next week. That's it for tonight. Thanks for joining us. Before we go, I'd like to show you something from a story on next week's edition. It's about a night a young man walked along a lonely tropical beach toward a circle of total strangers and heard the most intimate secrets of his dead father from a woman he'd never met. Your mother and I may have grown apart over the years, but I've always loved her too. The voice changed. The face changed. I realised then what was being conveyed to me was my father. Sometimes life gets just a bit too much and you can't cope. So I hope you don't hate me for that. I've made mistakes. She spoke in detail of his childhood. A childhood he had revealed to no one. I just want you to understand that I'm sorry for what happened. And I love you very much.